According to the World Health Organization, chronic diseases account for 75% of all deaths around the world and are associated with high economic burden. Traditionally, patients with chronic diseases are scheduled for discrete contact events with the healthcare system, visits to their GP, sessions with their physiotherapist, or an appointment for a special investigation of some kind, for example. The premise for integrating commercial wearable biosensors into the care pathway is that they allow for continuous and real-time monitoring of patients, and in doing so, could pave the way for better management of chronic illnesses. Specifically, commercially available wearable biosensors have the potential to provide detailed longitudinal data documenting patients' health and their progress during treatment or rehabilitation, instead of more labour-intensive, invasive and expensive alternatives. For instance, sleep apnea could be quickly diagnosed with a lightweight wearable that measures heart rate, breathing volume and snoring, instead of a heavy polysomnograph. Wearables containing inertial measurement units could be used to assess people's ability to ambulate safely and independently during specific movement tasks. And, driven by the size of the glucose sensing market and the increasing number of people with diabetes, a lot of investment has been made into developing minimally invasive glucose monitoring devices for the consumer. But in spite of these promises, commercially available wearable biosensors and the biometrics they generate have not been widely incorporated into clinical decision-making processes. The applications I've alluded to are still in the early stages of development. Very few have been approved for medical use and have really only been explored in an academic setting rather than in the real world. Similar to the vast majority of wearables designed to improve or assess athletic performance, the issue is that only a handful of body signals relevant to healthcare can be accurately measured using commercially viable wearable biosensors. But now that big tech companies like Apple, Google and Samsung have recognised the size of the potential market, significant endeavours are underway to grow the evidence base. The first hurdle identified by these companies was where to store all the data being gathered by the plethora of devices on the market. So each developed their own centralised platform. A smartphone application linked with the user's wearable that acts as a conduit between the biosensor and the data and insights it provides. The Apple Health, Google Health and Samsung Health apps all pull together health and fitness information like activity levels, blood pressure readings, weight, body fat, calorie intake, nutrient intake, existing medical conditions and sleep patterns, among other outcomes, on a single platform. And these companies are now leveraging these platforms to conduct research into the data that are being gathered. For instance, in 2017, Apple kicked off a project with Stanford Medicine known as the Apple Heart Study, which sought to see how well its watch could detect atrial fibrillation. Then, in November 2019, Apple opened enrollment in three health studies designed in partnership with academic researchers drawing on data from US owners of its watches and smartphones. The partnership hinges on the research kit application to capture real-world data from participants who can decide to opt into each study before their data are collected and analysed. Indeed, research institutions like universities are playing an increasing role in acting as the independent validators of wearable tech companies' products. For instance, University of Michigan researchers are tracking the amount of time that participants' average daily noise exposure exceeds the World Health Organization's guideline of a maximum of 70 decibels over a two-year period using the Apple Watch, and they're seeking to understand how this relates to the risk of hearing loss. Investigators at Brigham Women's Hospital are attempting to correlate measures like walking speed and heart rate with people's risk of developing atrial fibrillation or heart disease. And the largest and longest study with a target sample size of 1 million women over a 10-year period is designed in conjunction with the Harvard School of Public Health, whereby researchers are planning to use data about the frequency with which women have irregular menstrual cycles to inform screening guidelines for conditions like polycystic ovary syndrome. Unfortunately though, not all of these partnerships result in wearable success stories. 
In the next section, we'll discuss some of the most active areas of healthcare research involving consumer wearable biosensors. The digital health sector has yet to reach that point when clinical or market validation aligns with a sustainable business model. In the long run, the companies that succeed in this space may be those that best integrate the brash, consumer-oriented culture of the technology sector with the more conservative, regulation-bound ethos of drug and device development. Progress balancing clinical and market validation has been limited to four main areas. Physical activity tracking, the evaluation of sleep, ECG monitoring or the evaluation of atrial fibrillation, and finally, diabetes and continuous blood glucose monitoring. Consumer wearable devices offer a way for healthcare professionals to highlight the importance of physical activity to their patients. These devices provide an objective quantitative mirror for patients about their current habits and the improvements that they can achieve when they focus their efforts on increasing their physical activity levels. However, the interventions involving pedometers and smartphone apps across clinical populations show limited evidence of continued behavioral change beyond the duration of the original intervention. In a trial of 470 overweight or obese adults, subjects were randomized to a standard intervention which involved self-monitoring of their diet and an exercise regime, or an enhanced intervention which added a wearable device to the mix with a web interface to help participants monitor their diet and physical activity. After 24 months, both groups had similar improvements in body composition, fitness, physical activity and diet, but the addition of a wearable device actually resulted in less weight loss than the standard program. And in a second trial of 800 subjects aged between 21 and 65, the use of activity trackers for six months, either alone or with incentives, which included cash or a charitable donations, did not improve health outcomes like weight and blood pressure when compared with a control group. It seems that not everybody responds to the mirror incentive of a wearable in the same way. Future research needs to clarify what specific aspects of the device itself, the accompanying software, or the user's experience predicate a positive outcome and long-term adherence. And then there's a budding area of research involving the use of inertial measurement units, wearables that contain accelerometers, gyroscopes, and sometimes magnetometers to evaluate movement quality during physical activity or during specific tasks. For instance, wearables have been used to quantify performance during the six-minute walk test, a submaximal exercise test which involves walking continuously for six minutes along a 30-metre walkway. The traditional outcome for this test is the distance walked by the patient in the six-minute time frame. The quantified version of the test that is performed with the wearable biosensor might give information about the patient's walking symmetry or their turning technique as they go up and down the walkway. Wearable sensors containing inertial measurement units have also been used to evaluate the biomechanics of gait technique. The issue with these biomechanical outcomes, whether we're talking about symmetry or technique, is that it is unclear if they actually add anything to the clinical test, whether they can be used to, for example, identify an increased risk of falling, or if they provide the healthcare professional with additional information about their patient beyond what the standard test outcome provides. With the exception of proof of concept or exploratory studies, the reality is that there is currently no research in existence linking these kinds of biomechanical measures with real world, quality of life, treatment or performance outcomes. And that is true of clinical populations, athletes and the general public. Actigraphy can be considered an extension of physical activity tracking. Like pedometers that measure the number of steps an individual takes, or an accelerometer that gives a more general idea of their movement throughout the day, actigraphy involves the use of an accelerometer to objectively measure sleep. Compared with the gold standard of sleep tracking, polysomnography, 
actigraphy is very accurate for identifying the period of sleep, but it is less accurate for identifying sleep onset and periods of wakefulness. Specifically, when actigraphy is compared with polysomnography, its accuracy is approximately 90% for total sleep time, but only 55% for determining the correct sleep stage. A large number of consumer wearable devices purport to assess sleep-wake periods, total sleep time, and even sleep stages. The issue is that many of the companies that have developed these devices and systems haven't properly validated how they identify sleep-wake periods. In addition, the algorithms used to determine sleep-wake periods are proprietary and often unavailable to clinicians and the public. Although the data are not entirely consistent, most studies have found that consumer wearable devices overestimate total sleep time and sleep efficiency and underestimate wake after sleep onset compared with polysomnography. Nevertheless, technology improves over time and manufacturers' proprietary algorithms are constantly being updated. Patients are increasingly using these devices and looking to clinicians for guidance about what the data may mean and how to improve their sleep. Some devices use photoplethysmography, the same technology that is used to monitor your heart rate by measuring blood flow in tissue over time via flashing light emitting diodes or LEDs. Others use a combination of movement and heart rate variability data, which fluctuates and correlates with wakefulness and the different sleep stages. Manufacturers' applications can then integrate these data to display sleep information to the user and may also include benchmark data for what is considered normal. All of these data should be interpreted with caution though. Devices rely on indirect measures of sleep, have data loss problems, and some devices are more accurate than others. The more advanced devices only correlate approximately 70% of the time when compared with the gold standard of polysomnography. A position statement from the American Academy of Sleep Medicine encourages clinicians to become familiar with the disadvantages and potential benefits of consumer sleep technologies, including wearable devices. While they acknowledge the devices are not validated and cannot be used for the diagnosis or treatment of sleep disorders, they accept that patient-generated data may enhance the clinician-patient interaction when reviewed in the context of a clinical evaluation. Use of a device may indicate a patient's commitment to focus on sleep wellness, and the data may provide an opportunity to educate patients about the importance of healthy sleep habits. When it comes to commercially available wearable heart rhythm monitors, these devices can be useful in the diagnosis of arrhythmia in certain patients. Most come in the form of wearable wristbands and smartwatches, optical sensors integrated into the device use photoplethysmography to measure pulse rate. A rapid rise in heart rate that is associated with specific symptoms can help detect arrhythmias such as supraventricular tachycardia or atrial fibrillation. Increasingly, some of these devices have automated algorithms to detect pulse irregularity and can notify the user regarding possible arrhythmia. Studies assessing the effectiveness of smartwatch-based photoplethysmography algorithms for the detection of atrial fibrillation are ongoing, but the current research is promising. Smartwatches are also now able to record single-lead ECGs by using electrodes built into the back of the watch and a finger from the opposite hand placed onto an electrode built into the watch band to complete the circuit. These kinds of devices can be useful in the long-term monitoring for occurrence of arrhythmias, particularly in symptomatic patients with atrial fibrillation who have undergone rhythm control therapy, such as ablation. As technology advances and arrhythmia detection algorithms improve, the increased use of commercially available wearable heart rhythm monitors is likely to prove valuable in the diagnosis and management of certain patients with arrhythmia. A number of trials are currently underway investigating how best to integrate these devices into the care pathway. And then we have what many people consider to be the biggest prize in the consumer wearable device market, continuous blood glucose monitoring.
Blood glucose monitoring is important for diabetics to determine how much insulin to take or how much food to eat. There's also been a recent proliferation of healthy people who like to track their blood glucose levels out of curiosity or in an effort to improve their general wellness. Traditionally, to assess their blood glucose levels, diabetics need to prick their finger and let a drop of blood touch a disposable test strip in a meter that electrochemically analyzes and reports the glucose content. For someone with type 1 diabetes, that might need to occur 10 times a day. It hurts and over time leaves scar tissue on the fingertips, and it only gives diabetics snapshots of their blood glucose, rather than continuous readings. These shortcomings have inspired researchers to pursue a wearable solution, devices that are pain-free, non-invasive, and that can continuously monitor blood glucose levels. Non-invasive continuous glucose recorders could not only provide patients with instantaneous readings on which they can act, but could also provide the healthcare professional with weekly summaries detailing how often their patient has remained within the desired blood glucose range. By guiding treatment using time and range, continuous glucose data can provide a much more accurate outcome measure of how their patient is managing their blood glucose levels. Decades of research projects, scores of companies, and a lot of money has come and gone in the pursuit of this technology. Glucose measurement has been attempted using analytes in sweat, tears, saliva, urine, breath, blood, and interstitial fluid. And it has been measured using enzyme-based electrochemical detectors, optical detectors, and piezoelectric sensing. But so far, none of these technologies has been commercialized successfully. The problem is largely one of physiology. Consider the nature of sweat, tears, and saliva. These fluids vary throughout the day and are affected by external factors like airflow across the skin, humidity, hydration, and activity. Sweat varies from one spot to another on the body, may need to be elicited, and gets contaminated by things like skin creams and lotions. These are not trivial matters. Given the challenges of tears, sweat, and saliva, many researchers have turned to optical or spectroscopic techniques to measure glucose in tissue. The way that light is absorbed or scattered by tissue can reveal aspects of the tissue's microstructure, as well as the chemicals present and their molecular environment. But glucose's subtle optical signatures get buried amongst those of blood and melanin, which are both highly absorbing and are highly variable from person to person. And therein lies the issue facing engineers. Getting the wearable solutions to work on the body, every body, all of the time, is extremely challenging. Not just for blood glucose monitoring, but also for evaluating movement biomechanics, cardiovascular health, sleep, and a range of other health-related outcomes. And that concludes this lecture discussing the rise of consumer wearable devices in healthcare. In this lecture, I started by outlining the promise of consumer wearable biosensors for healthcare, how they might be useful, particularly in the management of chronic diseases. I then outlined four specific use cases of wearable biosensors for activity tracking, sleep, heart health, and blood glucose monitoring. In the next lecture, I'm going to discuss some of the research frameworks that have been developed to help move the field forward. I'm also going to talk about the challenges facing the field and the future directions for consumer wearable biosensors.